The I part three, histology. You may remember that in part one, we had the famous quote from Richard Dawkins, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. You can look it up if you don't believe me, and this is not a creationist controlled site. Dawkins goes on to say in page two, never mind whether cars and computers are really biological objects. The point is that if anything of that degree of complexity were found on a planet, we should have no hesitation in concluding that life existed or had once existed on that planet. Machines are the direct products of living objects. They derive their complexity and design from living objects and they are diagnostic of the existence of life on a planet. Now, do you notice something that's missing there? Not just any old life. They're not, the, uh, they're not evidence for the existence of bacteria on a planet. They are evidence of the existence of intelligent life on a planet. In fact, if we were to somehow divorce intelligence from life, they wouldn't even necessarily be a uh, life. They're, they are intelligence. They're evidence of intelligence. You find this, you know that there was something that not only lived, but could manipulate uh, objects for a purpose. Machines are the direct product of living, intelligent objects. But in any case, um, you can understand why he kind of didn't emphasize that. Um, but to move on, there's uh, G.G. Simpson, and the, you can find quotes like this every once in a while, um, because it's obvious, and people who want to have some kind of credibility have to acknowledge the obvious. A telescope, a telephone, or a typewriter is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Obviously, its manufacturer had a purpose in mind, and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. It too looks as if it had been made for a purpose. You can deny purpose if you want to. What you cannot deny is the appearance of design. This appearance of purposefulness is pervading in nature in the general structure of animals and plants, in the mechanism of their various organs, and the give and take of their relationship with each other. Accounting for this apparent purposefulness is a basic problem for any system of philosophy or of science. Well, okay, of course, unless you accept that purposefulness is real, in which case it's an advantage of that particular system of philosophy or of science. But anyway, I will point, make the point that the eye looks designed. And if you are trying to say that the eye really isn't designed, probably the best way to deal with that argument is to kind of try to turn it on its head. That is to say, you say the eye has the kind of design we expect from evolution, optimizing a basically flawed fundamental design, not starting with a perfect design like a perfect designer would do. That is the kind of reasoning that you would have to have. So we're going to look at the mistake of the eye. First, a little bit about human eye anatomy because the histology needs to fit into it. Um, you have, of course, the cornea with the pupil behind it, which is just a hole in the iris, and then the uh, lens and the ciliary body and so forth. And then behind, and this is the part we're gonna pay special attention to, is the retina which has the choroid behind it, and then the sclera, which is just tough stuff. Um, you've heard of sclerosis, arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. Well, this is the hard part of the eye. Um, the eye has a special place that sees better than most, which is called the fovea centralis, uh, or, or that just 
central fovea, of course. Uh, then it has the optic blind, uh, disc or blind spot where the optic nerve goes in and so come out the blood vessels to feed the eye on the inside. Now, some of you, uh, I don't know how far back you have to be to see this, uh, but if you close one eye, if you're closing the left eye, uh, then look at the circle. If you're closing the right eye, then look at the diamond. Okay, and as the diamond will move, it, it will come to a place where if you're, if you're doing the, the right eye looking, uh, you will see the um, diamond disappear briefly. If you're looking at it with your left eye, you'll see the circle disappear. If uh, some of you may be uh, too far forward in the center and you may not be able to see it quite as well, but probably most of you can. So where at a certain point, it just kind of fades out for a little bit. That's because the fovea will look at the uh, one part and when the image reaches the optic disc, it just disappears and you can see all the blood vessels coming out of it and you'll notice something else. All the blood vessels, they should go straight to the fovea because that's some, the most active part of your eye, right? But they don't. They branch around it. And the reason why is because you don't want those things in your way. Now, you can actually, in some cases, um, uh, turn out all the lights. I don't know if this thing will even do that. I doubt it. Let's just see. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we'll see. Um, but this room probably won't get dark enough uh, unless we shut the doors, and I'm not even sure then it will work. Um, but what you can do is you can find, a, you can have a spot, and you, uh, preferably something very bright, um, and everything else is dark. And you look to one side of that spot with one eye. The other eye you cover up. And when you do that, um, it has to be dark everywhere else, because otherwise this, this doesn't work too well. Uh, when you do that, uh, you will, uh, in a little while, you'll be able to see out of where the blind spot is, you'll see blood vessels coming out. You can actually see them that way. What happens is that normally we compensate so well, the brain automatically computes the blood vessels in the way, and so it, uh, it boosts the signal there, and you don't even see it. Um, whereas, uh, if uh, if you shine a light a little bit sideways to that, then the shadows will offset just a tiny bit, and you will pick up an outline of the blood vessels. I've seen, I've done it myself. It just it's, it's very difficult to do, and I tried to do it with a slide, and, and it, it doesn't work well here, because then you get light from all over. It has to be light from one spot. So if you want to try it sometime, you can. Um, now, so that's the gross anatomy. Now we're going to go to the histology of the eye because people are going to be saying all kinds of stuff and it helps to know what you're looking at. This is a, uh, uh, the retina with the choroid behind it and the sclera, the tough part here. The choroid has blood vessels. They're full of, um, oxygenated blood. In fact, um, the venous blood from the choroid is pretty close to equivalent to the arterial blood from most other organs. It has that kind of blood supply. Um, uh, in front of, uh, there's the sclera in front of the choroid, um, which you can see a bunch of red cells in. Um, there is the layer of epithelium here that's called the uh, pigmented layer. Um, it's, uh, uh, there's an abbreviation for it, which I'm 
blocking on right now, but we'll run into that abbreviation. Um, then there is the layer of the rods and cones, the photoreceptor layer. And then there's some nerve cell stuff. And then there are nuclei to the cells that connect to the rods and cones. And then there's another layer where nerves are going all kinds of crazy ways. And then there's finally the, uh, I'll take it back. This is the, this is the actually the rods and cones here. And then this is the in, intermediate, intermediate ones. And then here's another layer of, of, of fibers that are going on in all different directions. And finally, there are ganglion cells that collect all the information that is being processed here. You actually, the retina is part of the brain. It does uh, information processing before the uh, signals ever get back to the brain. And then finally, there's the, the ganglion cells, and then there's nerve fibers, and then there's a fine membrane at the very end of it. Um, here's another sh shot. This time, the light would be coming from on top. And you can see the, the uh, rods and cones area and the nuclei of the rods and cones. And then the, again, the outer plexiform layer, the inner nuclear layer, the inner plexiform layer, and then the ganglion cells, which actually send their axons back to the, to the brain. And here's a kind of a drawing of what you'd expect. That's what the histology looks like. The fovea is special because it doesn't have much of those layers. It has barely anything in one layer. Everything else is sent outside. That helps there to be less distortion. Um, uh, your peripheral vision has a certain amount of distortion can be tolerated because uh, you're not looking at it specifically most of the time. But the fovea is what you're specifically looking at it, and so the, the, the wires are thin, shall we say, in that area. And whatever processing is done for the fovea is done uh, towards the outside. It's kind of packed up that way. Now, um, this gave rise, this structure gave rise to criticism. And Dawkins, uh, the blind watchmaker, comments on page 93, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point toward the light with their wires leading backward towards the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light with their wires departing on the side nearest the light. Yet this is exactly what happens in all vertebrate retinas. Each photocell is, in effect, wired in backwards, with its wire sticking out on the side nearest the light. The wire has to travel over the surface of the retina to a point where it dives through a hole in the retina, the so-called blind spot, to join the optic nerve. This means that the light, instead of being granted an unrestricted passage to the photocells, has to pass through a forest of connecting wires, presumably suffering at least some attenuation and distortion. Actually, probably not much, but still, it is the principle of the thing that it would offend any tidy-minded engineer. And of course, God, if he designed the eye, would have been a tidy-minded engineer, and so he should have engineered it a different way. Um, to continue on page 94, a um, few paragraphs, uh, no, the next paragraph, I think. Uh, well, it's a few paragraphs later, I think. The different lines of evolution betray their independent origins in numerous points of detail. For instance, octopus eyes are very like ours, but the wires leading to their photocells don't point forward towards the light as ours do. Octopus eyes are, in this respect, more sensibly designed. They have arrived at a similar endpoint from a very different starting point. And the fact is betrayed in details such as this. You will find this is a theme. By the way, there's a um, Wikipedia uh, vertebrate eye. You'll see the, the retina uh, backwards with the nerves in front and the uh, 
And actually, they haven't drawn it as you've seen. There's several layers before you get to the nerves that actually go down. Um, and um, here is the cephalopod eye, um, which, by the way, doesn't have all those extra stuff in it, but we may get to why not. Um, and uh, instead has all the wires going down. And so the, uh, the light sensing cells are able to sense um, without having to have any distortion besides whatever debris is in the eye itself. And you'll notice that in order to have the vertebrate eye, you have to have a blind spot. Oh, um, Daniel Dennett. And again, you can find this online. Um, Brilliant as the design of the eye is, it betrays its origin with a telltale flaw. The retina is inside out. The nerve fibers that carry the signals from the eye's rods and cones, which sense light and color, lie on top of them and have to plunge through a large hole in the retina to get to the brain, creating the blind spot. No intelligent designer would put such cl a clumsy arrangement in a camcorder, and this is just one of the hundreds of accidents frozen in evolutionary history that confirm the mindlessness of the historical process. See, there's no need to do this. Why not wire it forwards and like the, like the octopus? Um, G.C. Williams, natural selection again, that's online. Every organism shows features that are functionally arbitrary or even maladaptive. My chosen classic is the vertebrate eye. It was used by Paley, appendix, as a particularly forceful part of his theological argument from design. As he claimed, the eye is surely a superbly fashioned optical instrument. Notice he concedes the point. The eye is, the eye is superbly fashioned optical instrument. It is also something else, a superb example of maladaptive historical legacy. Unfortunately for Paley's argument, the retina is upside down. The rods and cones are the bottom layer, and light reaches them only after passing through the nerves and blood vessels. Of course, the eye can still play its role as a precise visual instrument. The tissues intervening between the transparent humors of the eye cavity and the optically sensitive layer are microscopically thin. Yet, the fact of maladaptive design, however minimal in effect, spoils Paley's argument that the eye shows intelligent prior planning and the visual effect is real and routinely demonstrable. The reality of the shadow of the vascular tree and the seriousness of the problem it pre presents can be demonstrated with a flashlight and instructions from a visual physiologist. I would agree with that because I've seen them. This is only one of the functional problems related to the inversion of the retina. Another is caused by the optic nerve arising on the wrong side of the sensory layer so that it must go through a hole in the retina to get to the brain. That means that a large hole, and wherever it is there, there will be no vision. This is the reason for the blind spot, about 30 degrees right of the point of focus in the right eye, 30 degrees to the left of, in the left. Our retinal blind spots rarely cause any difficulty, but rarely is not the same as never. As I momentarily cover one eye to ward off an insect, an important event might be focused on the blind spot of the other. There would be no blind spot if the vertebrate eye were really intelligently designed, because it embodies many functionally arbitrary or maladaptive features of which the in inversion of the retina is merely one example. These features are there. I'd like to see what the other ones are, by the way. Uh, these features are there not for functional, but for purely historical reasons. Um, Francisco Ayala, Darwin's gift to science and religion. This one, I will have to say, I couldn't give you a website. I can tell you that if you do Google Scholar on that site, you'll find his book up, the page that this is supposed to come from is missing, but if you go over and search with these terms, you can actually find the quote anyway. Um, or you can find pieces of the quote that overlap so that you can um, reassure yourself that it really is there. 
One difficulty with attributing the design of organisms to the creator is that imperfections and defects pervade the living world. Consider the human eye. The visual nerve fibers in the eye converge to form the optic nerve, which crosses the retina in order to reach the brain, and this creates a blind spot. A minor imperfection, but an imperfection of design nevertheless. Squids and octopuses do not have this defect. The designer have greater love for squids and for humans, and thus exhibit greater care in designing their eyes than ours. You can see this is a theme. And I could give you about uh, another, probably twice as many commentators who all say the same thing. Uh, Kenneth Miller, Finding Darwin's God. Um, and again, this is online. To adopt the explanation of design, we are forced to attribute a host of flaws and imperfections to the designer. Speaking of eyes, we would have to wonder why an intelligent designer placed the neural wiring of the retina on the side facing incoming light. This arrangement scatters the light, making our vision less detailed than it might be, and even produces a blind spot at the point where the wiring, that the wiring is pulled through the light-sensitive retina to produce the optic nerve that carries visual messages to the brain. Remember, Kenneth Miller is, or wants to be, I think is, a believer in God. He just says God didn't design the eye. Now, of course, that kind of argument does not go unanswered. I'm going to give you, instead of a short-age creationist, I'm going to give you a long-age creationist. Uh, this is Rich Deem, who happens to be affiliated with uh, Reasons to Believe. That's the Hugh Ross organization. They believe in creation uh, just over long ages, um, but actual creation. And uh, he uh, has a something that notices the, you know, the human esophagus, people choke on it and die, and therefore it's poorly designed. Um, but uh, he will also talk about the eye. Um, and there are a couple other things he talks about. Design, poor design is something that's fashionable in uh, uh, evolutionary apologetics. Uh, so Deem comments, Dawkins doesn't know why the vertebrate retina is designed the way, this way because he doesn't really understand how the eye works. In fact, the retina is designed with slightly suboptimal light gathering abilities so that it will be functional for at least several decades. If it were designed according to Dawkins' tidy-minded engineer, it would not work at all, as we shall see. First, we need a short introduction to the physics of light. The electromagnetic spectrum emitted by the sun is composed of many different wavelengths, a small percentage of which are visible to our eyes. That is 370 to 730 nanometers. The near visible in wavelengths include the longer wavelengths, infrared, and the shorter wavelengths, which are ultraviolet. The amount of energy within each wavelength is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Therefore, electromagnetic energy that consists of shorter wavelengths, that is, ultraviolet light, is more energetic. Although the, usual, uh, the visual apparatus cannot detect the high energy wavelengths, it is still affected by them since the entire system is exposed to the full spectrum. In contrast, the rest of the body is protected from high energy light by pigment, melanin, in the skin. Even so, a lifetime exposure of the skin cells to this light can result in DNA damage, which may lead to the development of cancers. The eye contains a special layer of cells the retinal pigment epithelium. That's what that abbreviation was that I couldn't remember there earlier. RPE, which has complex mechanisms for dealing with toxic molecules and free radicals produced by the action of light. Specific enzymes such as the superoxide dismutase, uh, catalases, and peroxidases are present to eliminate potentially harmful molecules such as superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Antioxidants such as alpha tocopherol or vitamin E 
and ascorbic acid, vitamin C, are available to reduce oxidative damage. So the retinal pigment epithelium is actually protective of the rods and cones that are constantly getting bombarded, not only by visible light, but by ultraviolet light, uh, which could otherwise cause uh, severe damage. Because of continuous damage caused by light, the discs, along with the photopigments of the photoreceptor cells, are continually replaced by the RPE. And there's some notes that I forgot to enlarge for you. If this were not the case, the photoreceptors would quickly accumulate fatal defects that would prohibit their function. In addition, the RPE cells contain the pigment melanin, which absorbs stray and scattered light to improve visual acuity. Now, it's of interest that animals that live during, or, yeah, that go about their business during the day generally will have pigment in the back and it will absorb the light. Animals that need all the light they can get will actually have a reflective layer behind it, which is why if you go out at night and you shine a flashlight, suddenly the eyes light up at you because they're actually being reflected back. And that gives the, the visual mechanism it, uh, two shots at the same light. The RPE is in contact with the choroid layer, which contains a very large capillary bed, which has the largest blood flow per gram of any tissue in the body. That's for oxygenation and for cooling. Why is the blood so flow so high in the choroid? Since the RPE and photoreceptor cells are in constant regeneration, they require a high rate of exchange of oxygen and nutrients. In addition, it appears that the high rate of blood flow is required to remove heat from the retina to prevent damage resulting from focused light, the old magnifying glass in the sun phenomenon. You know, if you look at the sun briefly, uh, and then you look away, you'll have this area that's not seeing as well, and uh, things will look a little darker because it takes a while for the photoreceptors to recover. If you look at it for longer, you can damage your eyes, but it would damage them even more if you didn't have a little cooling mechanism there behind keeping it from getting too hot. Otherwise, you'd cook your retina in short order. So why is Dawkins' tidy-minded engineer design such a bad idea? Dawkins thinks that the neural layer should be under the photoreceptors, putting them between the photoreceptors and the choroid. Where would the RPE, uh, the retinal uh, pigmented epithelium, which is required to regenerate the photoreceptors, go? If it were between the neural layer and the choroid, it would be too far away from the photoreceptors to constantly regenerate them. Um, in addition, this design would put another layer between the photoreceptors and their blood supply, reducing the exchange of oxygen and nutrients, and minimizing the ref effectiveness of the choroid in removing heat from the receptors. Dawkins' idea of good evolution would prevent the photoreceptors from being regenerated and would likely lead to heat damage. Such a design would certainly fail within the first year of use. It's a good thing that God does not do design the way evolutionists would. Now, <clears throat> uh, you would think that this is an argument that depends on who you want to listen to, although I, I think that the uh, design people have a better argument at this point. But I ran across uh, a, an article in Vision Research for people who are evolutionists, and it made this point. Vertebrate eyes are of the simple or camera type with a single optical system that creates an image on the retina in the back of the eye. There, the visual information is encoded at, as nervous signals by photoreceptors processed by retinal neurons and then sent to the brain via the optic nerve. Surprisingly, at first sight, the retinal neurons are located between the lens and the light-sensitive parts of the photoreceptors. The tissue scatters some light, which leads to loss of light and image blur. The inverted retina has therefore long been regarded as inferior. Here, 
we provide evidence that the inverted retina actually is a superior space-saving solution, especially in small eyes. The inverted retina has most likely facilitated the evolution of image-forming eyes in vertebrates, and it still benefits especially small and highly visual species. And I'm going to read uh, some parts of this. The image created by the optical system of a vertebrate eye is translated to the nervous system by the light-sensitive photoreceptors. The signals are conveyed to retinal neurons for processing and eventually transmi transmission to the brain. The intuitive option would be to place these neurons behind the photoreceptors such as such that they are out of the way for incoming light. This is the case, for example, in cephalopod eyes, squids, octopi, uh, octopodes, etc. Um, vertebrates, however, have inverted retinas with the retinal neurons being situated <coughs> between the lens and the photoreceptors. This solution is usually considered to be disadvantageous because of the scattering of some light on its path towards the photosensitive layer. One may therefore wonder why just the vertebrate lineage has diverged into many highly visual species. By studying small fish eyes, we have identified a considerable functional advantage of the inverted retina. And uh, going, I'm skipping over most of it, um, uh, it's worth reading and it's available to read, but I'm going to read the, the, the meat of it, the discussion. In the smallest vertebrate eyes, the space between the lens and the photoreceptor's light-sensitive outer segments is completely filled with retinal cells. In other words, instead of having a big vitreous like we have in the human eye, or um, when you have smaller eyes, that whole area has got uh, 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 extra cells. Um, this is a highly space efficient solution because otherwise the retinal neurons would have to be placed distally to the outer segment, which would make the entire eye substantially larger. You can pack it all in in one place for very small creatures. Alternatively, some other space has to be found in the body, such as in cephalopods where neurons with similar functions are organized in optic lobes separate from the eyes. So you can have it one of two ways. You can have it in the retina doing all this calculating stuff, or you can just send the wire straight back. And if you do, then you have to have the same processing going on, just in a little different lobe, which is how the octopi do it. The cephalopod solution requires long distance neural wiring between the photoreceptors and higher order neurons which is space demanding as well as it leads to slower processing and noisier signals. The vertebrate eye is actually more efficient in terms of the neurons. Early be vertebrates benefited considerably from the inverted retina that they had inherited from their eyeless predecessors. Notice this guy is a believer in evolution, a believer in random evolution as far as I can tell um, and there's you know he's still saying that the design is better and that comes from about by invagin the invaginating type of eye formation in vertebrates this mode of eye formation has been considered to be accident the accidental reason for the apparently disadvantageous inverted retina notice um, all these people including Landon Nelson, I'm betting that that's the same Nelson that wrote Nelson and Pelger. Um, we think that this evolutionary event has been a favorable incident because it allowed early vertebrates to accommodate relatively large eyes in small heads, thus favoring the evolution of vertebrates into a large group of animals which many, of which many are highly visual. Eyes with inverted retinas perform well irrespective of their sizes except for very small eyes with low spatial resolution. This type of retina has thus to be considered superior instead of inferior. With the latter having been the previously general, held general opinion. Only in large eyed species the scattering effect of the inverted retina may indeed pose a disadvantage and the inverted retina of cephalopods may be superior although it also has its problems. See above. 
Franz and co-workers have put forward the theory that the Mueller cells may act as a light guides in vertebrate retinas. The cells are hypothesized to pick up visual information at the inner limiting membrane and guide it undistorted and with little loss through the retinal neurons to the photoreceptors. So there's a workaround that's very, very nice. In addition to the space-saving advantage, the invaginating mode of eye formation brings the photoreceptor outer segments in close proximity to the pigment epithelium that regenerates isomerized visual pigment and in many species regulates light flux, flux to the photoreceptors. It also allows for the nourishment of the metabolically highly active photoreceptors via the choroid, which keeps light absorbing hemoglobin out of the path of incoming light. You see, you can have a few blood vessels feeding the nerves, or you can have massive blood vessels feeding the retina in front. Which would you rather? These additional advantage, however, probably because became of importance first when vision had evolved into a sophisticated sensory system and eye size had increased. They are therefore of little value for the understanding of the early evolution of vertebrate vision. Um, one of the problems that it came up with um, is if the eye is such a bad design, why didn't vertebrates have octopus-like eyes? Interestingly enough, if they had, land animals that see a lot more light would not have been able to be formed. So um, the evolutionists actually, if they believed their own theory, would realize that there had to be it, uh, it's some kind of advantage to begin with, otherwise it wouldn't have gotten started. Instead of asking why vertebrates possess apparently problematic inverted retinas, one may ask why such space-saving retinas are limited to vertebrates and a handful of invertebrates. The answer is the same for both questions. Animals have their group-specific eye and retina types because of common descent within each phylogenetic group. Vertebrates have evolved into, except for where there's been a horizontal transfer, I guess. <laughs> um, vertebrates have evolved into the group of animals which most heavily rely on vision with high spatial resolution. The inverted retina has most likely been an important factor since it allowed for, allows for massive retinal processing of visual information without investment of precious space and weight and use the inside of the eye to do it. And then the Mueller cells, um, and this one uh, is also found uh, online. Uh, this is the first article as far as I can tell, but after this there have been dozens of other articles doing the same kind of thing um, and showing that in fact the Mueller cells do what they're supposed to do. Um, the abstract, although biological cells are mostly transparent, they are phase objects that differ in shape and refractive index. Any image that is projected through layers of randomly oriented cells will normally be distorted by refraction, reflection, and scattering. Counterintuitively, the retina of the vertebrate eye is inverted with respect to its optical function, and light must pass through several layer, tissue layers before reaching the light-detecting photoreceptor cells. Here we report on the specific optical properties of glial cells present in the retina, which might contribute to optimize this apparently unfavorable situation. We investigated intact retinal tissue and individual Mueller cells, which are radial glial cells spanning the uh, entire retinal thickness. Mueller cells have an extended funnel shape, a higher refractive index than their surrounding tissue, and are oriented along the direction of light propagation. Transmission and reflection confocal microscopy of retinal tissue in vitro and in vivo show that these cells provide a low scattering passage for light from the retinal surface to the photoreceptor cells. Using a modified dual beam laser trap, we could also demonstrate that individual Mueller cells act as optical fibers. Furthermore, their parallel array in the retina is reminiscent of fiber optic plates used for low distortion image transfer. 
So we're taking advantage of the same kind of thing uh, ourselves without realizing that the I did it before we did. Thus Mueller cells seem to mediate the image transfer through the vertebrate retina with minimal distortion and low loss. This finding elucidates a fundamental feature of the inverted retina as an optical system and ascribes a new function to glial cells. There is the concept. Um, the pictures are not quite as obvious, so I didn't try to uh, uh, show you actual photos of histology. But the concept is you have the Mueller cell that guides the light to various cones and also to rods at the end. And you can see here's one that's guiding light through the the cells to a, a section of rods and also to one cone. Most structures in the retina, especially those in the nerve fiber layer and both plexiform layers, are phase objects that necessarily cause light scattering. In contrast, the optical properties and geometry of Mueller cells are consistent with those of optical fibers so that they serve as low scattering conduits for light through the retina. The low scattering is likely due to their peculiar ultrastructure because highly scattering objects such as mitochondria are rare or even absent. These cells have been engineered to do exactly what they're supposed to do. Whereas abundant long thin filaments are oriented along the cell axis, thereby setting a dielectric anisotropy as typically seen in photonic crystal fibers. We do this. Now we see that nature did it before us. The end feet of Mueller cells cover the entire inner retinal surface and have a low refractive index, allowing a highly efficient entry of light from the vitreous into the Mueller cells. It's like they scoop it all up and then they funnel it down. At the same time, the increasing refractive index, together with their funnel shape and nearly constant light guiding capacity, capability make them ingeniously designed light collectors. Good thing they didn't say designer, they would have had to uh, uh, retract this paper. Skipping on, on average every mammalian Mueller cell is coupled to one cone photoreceptor cell responsible for sharp seeing under daylight conditions, that is photopic vision plus a species-specific number of rod photoreceptor cells, 10 in both man and guinea pig, serving low light level or scotopic vision. Thus, in the case of photopic vision, the parallel array of Mueller cells may preserve the initial image resolution by guiding the light directly to their respective cone photoreceptor cells, minimizing image distortion. This array might also serve to improve image contrast by increasing the signal to noise ratio. In scotopic vision, the dark, Mueller cells could reduce the loss of intensity by minimizing light reflection, particularly at the inner retinal surface. In summary, Mueller cells in the retina assume the role of optical fibers and reliably transfer light with low scattering from the retinal surface to the photoreceptor cell layer. At the same time, their funnel shape leaves 80% of the retinal volume for other cells and neur the neuronal connectivity and might thus spatially decouple light transport from neuro sig signaling signal processing. So think about it. The design is so good that you can have 80% for everything else and the Mueller cells just simply bypass all of that stuff. Now, Divine design predicts that the design will be optimized. I think that's fair. And there can be degeneration, but the basic plan should be optimized. Evolutionary design can predict anything. Well, actually not quite, but, but if you're not getting too technical. The d evidence we have does not prove or disprove evolution in this case. Evolution doesn't make any predictions and therefore um, it really doesn't 
uh, you know, whatever happens, I in, it's consistent with evolution. But anti-ID bias causes blindness to the facts and discourages the appreciation of good design. Ah, oh, it's a bad design. Why look any further? This is not the only instance of such blindness and science stopping. And remember, they accuse that uh, design is a science stopper. In this particular case, the assumption that there is no design is a science stopper. And that is true for both vestigial organs and junk DNA. And there are probably other examples too. But those are the most obvious ones. You see, in order for the argument to work, it has to be theological. That is, it, there has to be suboptimal design. And so you desperately want to see suboptimal design. And even if it turns out to be optimal, you don't want to see that. The teeth of this anti-ID argument resides in the mistakes. This argument discourages us from finding out that the mistakes really are not true mistakes. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, yes, Jack. Oh, actually, uh, oh, you're going to hand it back. Okay. Uh, and then we'll bring it back to you afterwards. Sure. Uh, can you pass the mic back? Thanks. Go ahead, Jack. You know, the design of the eye has been <clears throat> a real fascination. If you simply look into it, there's, there's something to me, however, that's totally counterintuitive. And that is uh, the invagination of an eye spot somehow predestines a so-called camera eye to have an inverted retina, as if at that stage, Natural selection had no ability to choose a better model since it would, in that early simple stage, it would have been a choice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to ask the question of why evolution chooses one and not the other and how, the, uh, how somehow in uh, the Nautilus it chose forward-facing um, uh, receptors with... Uh, with the wires coming out behind so that when the octopus came along it could have the, the forward-facing retina. Uh, it's of interest that, that um, the, uh, the objects or the, the creatures that uh, have um, uh, the, the forward-facing retina are in lower light and are less susceptible to the problem of heat burning. I think that there would be a huge problem if uh, if there were uh, if you were to try to take a, an octopus eye and put it out in broad daylight. I think it'd be um, a little on the difficult side for the animal. I guess I'm slightly amused by the suggestion that evolution is powerless to make a better choice early on. You just got to make the wrong choice, according to these reviewers. Yes. Um, there, there are other aspects of this that weren't brought out. First of all, in the fovea, where vision is sharpest, uh, actually, uh, you measure it by putting two spots as close together as possible and, see and find the point where they merge to one. Yeah. And that gives you the receptive field of particular cells. That is so small in, our, in the areas of the fovea that have the greatest amount of detailed vision. There are 120 million rods and 5 million cones going from the eye to the brain. Now, if every one of those photocells had that level of detail detection, just think of the, prob the increased problem of extracting shape and other kinds of information from what's going into the brain. Whereas basically, the only way you get real detail information is by looking directly at 
the object. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, as you go laterally in the retina, the number of receptors that are attached to an optic nerve fiber via the inter intervening uh, retinal neurons goes up and up and up and up. So you get you get uh, rather large receptive fields and you don't see a lot of detail. But the sensitivity is so good in that part of the eye that you, the, the physics suggests single photons are being responded to as a visual event, yeah. not, not giving detailed vision. But that's a cue to look at it. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine what the, the uh, visual cortex would look like if we had that level of detail vision throughout the whole yeah. retina. Well, you know, I think one question that should be asked if we have, uh, you know, Dawkins, Tidy Mighty, an engineer, one of the questions I would ask him is, well, what code would you use? And Dawkins has the foggiest clue as what code we sh he should use. I can well imagine if we used that kind of logic overtly, we'd be roundly criticized. Um, but, I mean, the truth of the matter is that if this is all digital, that's the level at which you have to operate. And the fact of the matter is that um, you know, if you're going to create one new protein, um, you know, your probabilities are in the, you know, 10 to the minus 77 order of magnitude, and that's just for a, you know, routine protein, 150 uh, bases or so. So it's, or 158, not bases, but uh, amino acid residues. That's, you know, when you think about it, that's, huge difficulty and the fact of the matter is that the reason evolution survives is because people are waving those questions off there is another point and then I'll be quiet and that is that the retinal neurons when you light directly to the fovea especially the most central part of the fovea uh, does not go through these cells because they're off to the side Yes. Um, In other words, there is may, a direct light path, or almost direct light path, right. directly to the fovea where we see the greatest detail. And I think by that time you no longer need Mueller cells. With are the they Mueller there? Cells, I think that's correct. Uh, that the Mueller cells are primarily where you've got all this stacks of stuff. But the Mueller cells just simply bypass it. You know, and what that means is that this kind of, oh, it's backwards, well, try turning, it, try turning it upside down. I mean, you either, you either have to turn it part way upside down, in which case you have the photosensors away from all blood supply, and if you look at the sun, you're cooked. Oh, um, maybe, maybe, maybe we should also point out that cephalopods live in the water. Right. They don't have to deal with all of this light intensity. Yeah. You exactly. go down a meter, and the light intensity yeah. that's transmitted is, I've forgotten what the attenuation factor is, but it's like a hundredth or. Yeah, so that the, there the sensitivity isn't quite as, I mean, it isn't quite as important. Um, but the vertebrate eye was meant to be used at least part of the time in, in fairly intent, uh, light intense situations. Now, did you, want to make a comment too and then we have one back here and Ariel well I, I was here talking about Mueller cells just want to raise the question are there any Mueller cells in the fovea as far as I know no but then you don't mm. need them there yeah yeah yes I have a couple of questions and observations based on purely medical school freshman level of understanding, which in my case was close to 70 years ago. But, um, and also I took comparative anatomy at, in college and pre-med, but I don't recall that it was ever gone into in this detail. But uh, my question is, 
as I understand it, uh, eagles and certain flying predators are considered the most visually acute creatures that we have on this earth. What does their retina look like? I did not look that up. Um, well, they are vertebrates. So. They are vertebrates, and oh, they're—I mean, they uh, all vertebrates have this quote inverted. Uh, so system. maybe we can assume that it is inverted too, but I'd like to know, yeah, yeah, what the cellular detail would look like. It, it's of interest that that the vertebrates seem to be as good as or better than the cephalopods in in actual vision. So. Uh, that certainly would the, be the a... The argument is, and, and this is an important point, the argument is that, well, maybe it is compensated for, but it's a bad design to begin with because you have all that stuff in front and then you have the optic nerve uh, with the blind spot. And... <coughs> I, I think that probably the best argument is the one that was, and I quoted it, you know, the last two people are, as far as I know, uh, standard atheist, um, and, and, and they're recognizing that there is, the, the one guy called it design. <laughs> yes, and also the fact that the most visually acute creatures on this planet, we will assume, since they are vertebrates, have exactly that same basic design. I'm surprised that I don't hear that as an argument, uh, of a kind of a finishing touch argument for intelligent design. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I saw this same kind of argument with, uh, with junk DNA. Oh, yes. You know. And how about uh, the cosmic dust? You know, it's, it's that kind of really, in a way, if you think about it, it's a poor argument. Uh, it would be a good argument if you knew the mind of the uh, creator and you knew that he deliberately put in flaws, uh, then you could probably get mad at him. Or you knew that he d wouldn't ever do it any way but what you think. Um, but, you know, the book of Job kind of illustrates that we don't really know as much as we think we do. Now the next question is about the cephalopods, the octopi and so forth. I. Uh, perhaps you've already given a more cogent answer, and that is that they live in such a dark milieu. But uh, is there any is there any relevance to the fact that uh, water itself is a diff entirely different refractory index uh, than yes. the, the milieu that we live in? There is uh, relevance to that. In fact, the the human cornea actually does some focusing of its own. So the lens does not have to be near as fat in our eye as it does in the cephalopod eye. One of the things that was interesting was that there's almost Haeckelian distortion of that comparison. That is to say, uh, they didn't show the cornea and the vertebrate eye sticking out, and they didn't show the, uh, uh, although the fish probably don't have as much of it one sticking out because they don't need to. Um, they have to do all of their bending with the lens itself. And so there's a whole bunch of design considerations that go into that. Um, can you pass the mic back and while we're there, why don't you um, make your comment, uh, Ariel? Well, I, uh, I appreciated the argument of the uh, wavelengths uh, uh, problem, the light problem uh, with the retinal cells. I wonder if... Uh, associated with that and just as important as a nutritional factor and that the choroid has to be very right next to the uh, rods and cones in order to uh, replace those uh, discs which uh, we replaced most of our 
one day, every day, or almost, uh, we're, we're constantly replacing these discs, not, anyway, every few days. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, you have to have that, that blood supply there to absorb all these old discs. If they were pointed the other direction, uh, as the uh, some evolutionists uh, say, and some of them don't, uh -huh. uh, eventually your eyeball would fill up unless you had a choroid layer right there to, to absorb them. Yeah. And uh, you'd eventually end up with an eyeball full of yeah. uh, discs and uh, blindness uh, associated with that. Well, there is one more point that I think is missed mm. in all of this, and that is that at least at present, all animals have to start as a single cell and then gradually move out to, to uh, a multi-celled organism that has all these organs that have been put together. Um, often evolutionists who are arguing in, about this sound almost like they want to make cameras instead of having living cells differentiate into the various forms that they that they um, that they t eventually take they have no clue as to how that works they have no clue as to how you take a cell that is undifferentiated and turn it into a Mueller cell you know you have to get rid of most of the mitochondria but then there's a bunch of other stuff you have to line up all the proteins um, so that the light will tend to go down them as if it was a uh, fiber optic uh, cable. And you need to have a denser in the center and less dense in the outside so that the light tends to want to refract straight down the middle. And then you have to make the nucleus transparent. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in there that just, uh, it boggles the imagination. And remember that every single one of those has to be coded for either in the DNA, which goes to everywhere, but is suppressed everywhere else except for where it's used in the Mueller cell, or else in some kind of an epigenetic information thing, or maybe in both. It is complicated, it is horribly complicated. The more we look at it, the more we realize that we haven't a clue how to do it. If you were to ask Dawkins or Dennett or uh, Kenneth Miller or anybody Ayala, it doesn't matter. You could not get them to even think about how to, how the DNA code for that is, if it's even DNA code. Maybe it's 90% epigenetics. We don't know. Nobody knows. And for us to stand in judgment of our creator and say, oh, well, this is a bunch of uh, poorly designed stuff, they have no clue. And the more we look at it, the more we realize that, you know, the design wasn't that bad after all. Um, uh, there is a reason why the rods have to face away from the lens. Because at the body of the rods, that's where the discs are continually being formed. And at the distal tip end of them, they're being continually shed. And the shed uh, discs have to be removed. They're removed by the pigment epithelium, which phagocytically removes them and recycles the materials away from the center of the eyeball. If you didn't have this process, the rods would not be renewing their ability to sense light. And so ultimately, you would lose the ability for vision uh, and sharp acuity and sense altogether in intense light. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a problem. If you had it the other way, as Dr. Roth put it, you would just end up with an eyeball full of junk. That, that, that would be the That's real, not going to work. That would be the real junk material. That would be real junk. That, that <laughs> simply wouldn't cannot work. In fact, there are diseases. Um, there is such a thing as retinitis pigmentosa, which is a disorder in the interaction between the rods and the pigment epithelium. 
where the, pick, uh, where the discs from the rods are not being removed efficiently enough by pigment epithelium and they build up and they cause problems. The person loses eyesight. So you see these kinds of processes are very much um, vital to function. You cannot separate one from the other and somehow expect, yeah. oh, it should have worked the other way. A comment here and then one up there. This discussion of the eye reminds me of the times in the Bible when Jesus restored somebody's sight. He didn't just restore an eyeball with goo. It was much more complicated in the eye itself and in connecting to the brain. It, it was a tremendous miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those, uh, those stories are, I think, evidence of creative power that we have no idea how it works. Uh, we as physicians would not even think about that kind of thing. And there's more to it even than that, because the man born blind not only needed his eyesight restored, he needed the back part of his brain repaired. That was not done with clay to the eyeball. I had a student in Canada who told me that when she was born, something was wrong with her eye, one of her eyes. I forget what it was. But they covered it up because they didn't want to do surgery until she was old enough. She's blind in that eye. Even though it's fully functional, the way it looks and it, everything should be working, she can't see out of it. Yeah, the same thing is true for, they they take kittens and sew their eyes shut mm -hmm. for a little longer than they should. They, they wind up not, the, the eyeball works fine as far as you can tell, but it, there's, there's nothing to send it to. Mm -hmm. the, the connections just aren't there and, and, and the kittens can live to old age and they're still blind. And so there's, uh, there's processing in the eye itself, and then there's processing in the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's of a complexity that we have no idea how to, you know. If I were God, I could raise Lazarus. All I'd have to do is go back to my data banks and, and say, uh, let's put him back to the way he was, let's say, when he lost consciousness. Go in there, pick out all the germs, clean out the various toxins, and then start him running again, okay? If I was God, I would have no clue as to what to do with a man born blind. We were created for eternity. So I would like, uh, as, if there's an answer to this, what will our eyes be able to do in a perfect world, in a perfect universe, uh, is there indications now of how far our eyes will actually be able to uh, go and see and you know and right now they colorize uh, pictures of the Orion or, and so on. There's actually a verse in the Bible that describes that. It starts out with, I have not seen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be capable of seeing, right? <laughs> or ear heard. Yeah. So the eye was created for something that we don't have any idea right now. That's right. That's right. We, uh, you know, um, Newton, who probably had more reason to be proud than any other man of his era, um, said he felt like a child at the seashore picking out uh, seashells that are interesting when the whole ocean of truth was in front of him. Mm -hmm. And if we can catch a vision of that, we have, we have so little idea. I mean, every once in a while we, oh, Mueller cells. Well, of course, because I remember the Mueller cells when I was a medical student, I had to learn that. But we had no idea what they were for. <laughs> they were named by some guy who saw them, you know, and obviously named Mueller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, you know, said, oh, look, there's these cells here, you know? But nobody had a clue as to what they were supposed to be doing. 
And now it appears that they've put the finishing touches on the eye that if you look, if you shine the light down into the eye, probably 90 plus percent of the light is scarfed up by those cells and transmitted past all that wiring to bypass it and go straight to the, uh, straight to the light sensing cells. Just, and we just discovered that, what was it, 2007 or something like that? I mean, it's jaw-dropping to think of all of the stuff that we don't even know. I think we had a comment here, and you do have one afterwards. The class might be interested to um, see if you can find, it was a 2020 program this week on the UCLA doctor Azori, A-Z-O-R-I, who is transplanting hands. And while they interviewed him, um, and then they got to his patient and they walk you through that surgical procedure, he said if anyone was ever tempted really to, to believe in some kind of design, it would have to be either the eye or the hand. And he studied for 12 years, way beyond his medical profession, to learn how to attach a human hand. It's, it's a fascinating program. Um, I think there were seven surgeons. They had two beds. Um, to keep one hand alive from the donor. And, and, and this was interesting. He said to the patient who had gotten a rare disease where he was losing his hands and his feet, he said, uh, I, you know, the good news is we're gonna, be, we're gonna try to transplant a hand on you, or your left hand, but we're gonna have to take your feet off because I want you to be strong. I want you to work out with the therapist and get really strong because I don't wanna put a new hand on you and then have you stumble and fall. And so the, the patient was determined to, to follow every direction the doctor gave him. He worked with a, a therapist and worked out in a gym. Um, he lost his legs. He had prosthetics. He got strong. Uh, the pictures of him near death from the disease he had, and then when he worked out to get strong, to fit himself to get this hand, it was just amazing. Um, I guess they've been doing this for a while, but they're cutting it up higher. And he said, they showed a picture on the screen of how they put tabs so that when they reattach the new hand, they make sure they're getting the right vessels, the right nerves, the right muscles connected to the right places so they have little color tabs. It, it's an amazing thing. It's on 2020. But, he didn't give any indication that he believed in a creator, but he said, if you were ever tempted to think that, if you, if you knew about the complexity of the human hand, that, that's probably, or the eye, yeah. the, both of those. Don't even think about transplanting eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, comment down here, I think. Can we pass the mic down? Yeah, we were created to uh, last through eternity. But uh, Christian apologist, you just a little while ago quoted Dim, who says, well, whatever the I is, you know, D-E-M, I think that's the last name. You, you had the abstract there. Whichever way the I is, it needed to last for several decades, and we're OK. Well, be before, uh, before you're too hard on him, let's just point out that if you had an evolutionary uh, committee design the eye, it wouldn't last for five years probably. We'd all be blind by now. Because we, we would have literally cooked the backs of our retinas any number of times. I mean, you know, they always tell you, don't look at an eclipse or you'll, sure. right? Yeah. Okay. Well, just imagine if that was permanent every time. Well, you cook that one, you cook that one, you cook that one. Pretty soon you got no le retina left. The one follow-up thing. Um, when the eye is sh sword shot um, of a rabbit, for example, is it that perhaps that the um, genes that are controlling the retina, they're all turned off so the eye cannot see after some time? Just like the 
Um, in Hawaii, those in the caves, the, the fish just wandered in, and within six weeks, they lose their vision. Um, yeah, we, don't <coughs> we don't really understand. I mean, we understand a little bit of it. Apparently, the PAC-6 gene has to do with eye uh, uh, control as to when to, where to grow one. But uh, how it does that, um, and then all of the other steps that are necessary, and how, many, how much DNA and how many proteins does it take, and can you get there by one gradual step after another? Um, the answer to the final question is almost certainly no, mm -hmm. which means that evolution should fail, period. I think the intricacies of the retina are mind-boggling, but if possible, the intricacies of the integration function of the brain is and for the eye is even more remarkable uh, as one who has pretty advanced macular degeneration in my left eye so that uh, I have complete blindness in the center but passable peripheral vision I will have to say that the fact that I don't even appreciate that that's happening that that is a fact because the, my brain is capable of giving me perfectly normal appearing eyes. I, as I look at you, I don't see any blind spot. And I see just as you would see me. And yet, if I close my good eye and try to look at you with my left eye, I couldn't even see you. Now that is remarkable. And something even more remarkable, I think, that might serve as a benediction to this, is that we as Adventists look forward to the time when there will be no sun because God himself will be with us and he shines brighter than any sun or all of them together and so bright that they will actually, that the brightness extinguishes the life, not just the eyes, but the life of people who are not specially adapted, shall we say, and yet we will adore it. Now how can that be? There you are. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It's Neither hath it entered into has the it heart of man. Answer. And yet from Sabbath to Sabbath, and from new moon to new moon shall all flesh come to worship him. We really don't know what's coming. We, we have no clue. Yeah, really. um, I, I think that uh, our, our job at present is to simply cooperate where God Amen. asks us to and then let uh, what happens happens and it's going to be fun. Amen. Well, next week we will talk about the philosophy of science and theology. And uh, then uh, uh, we'll see what happens the week after. Uh, and, the, and the week after that one, I think I'll talk on Jesus and creation, um, unless we get something else that intervenes that uh, is more pressing.